Welcome to this complete beginner's guide to Rule the Waves 3. I'm going to do a mini tutorial series based on a game of France done in a really small size, set to 1890 at the very beginning of the game, just so that you learn the basics. You don't need to know about aircraft or missiles or any of those kinds of things, just solidly how to create a fleet of gunships that can go out, fight, and sink the enemy. We load up the game till we get the splash screen. I'm going to press continue as I've already developed a small navy, which if you saw my previous visit uh, video, you will have seen. So here is a small size French navy. It's fine for understanding the basics. It's not in any way um, inferior because it's small size, because everyone else is small size. If we have a look at the Almanac here, sometimes called Jane's Fighting Ships, you can see that uh, France has four battleships, Germany one, Austria-Hungary two, the British six, Italy three, Japan one, USA two, Russia four, and Spain two. We're in completely the right ballpark compared to other navies. And if you look at our budget, we have uh, 84 and a half thousand, which actually puts us in second place. The Russians are in third with 78,000. The British are number one with 137,000. Likewise, if you look at our tonnage, we are 86,000. The Russians are 85, but the British are 189, more than double the amount of tonnage compared to everyone else. And all the others uh, trail behind. Our uh, technological development is the same for everybody, except Japan. We are all average, except Japan, which is behind. Um, you can get further ahead in research or further behind in research, depending upon how much effort you put into research, uh, creating new stuff. So, good news, all of our, our fleet is appropriately sized. The big thing in... Uh, operating a navy is to make sure that you stay within budget. The budget is shown here. There's a lot of figures here, the yearly budget, the monthly budget, how much you're spending on maintenance, how much you're spending on construction, on aircraft, on research, on extra specialist training, uh, on intelligence. You'll see several of these are zero at the moment. And your total expenses, but none of that super matters. What really matters are these two numbers at the bottom your monthly balance and your funds. So our monthly balance at the moment is 2,327 in the black. So we are running a surplus and that surplus will be fed into our funds, our savings. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't run a monthly balance that goes into the red or that if you do, that you, um, you have plenty of funds to draw down on so that you can return back to a positive monthly balance. Although our fleet is pretty good, if you look at the location, you'll notice that only the four battleships, uh, this cruiser and this corvette, are actually in home waters in Northern Europe. Everything else is out policing the empire. If you go to this area overview, you will see all the sea zones in the world listed and various details described, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. The most important one is this one, FS requirements, foreign station requirements. How much tonnage do you have to put in these sea zones in order to satisfy your imperial commitments? So in West Africa, we need 4,000. The actual tonnage we have is six and a half, so well over. Ditto the Indian Ocean, and also similar in the South Pacific. In Southeast Asia, where we have our biggest number of colonies, we need 9,000 and we have 14 and a quarter thousand. So it would be lovely to be able to extract one of those ships uh, and send it back. However, the smallest ship that we have out there is 5,600 tons, which is ever so slightly too much to send back without sending our foreign station requirements into the red. 
down here there's a tonnage on foreign stations check and currently it says okay but if we were to send Safax uh, back home this would go red and the uh, number there would show us how many tons short we would be um there is a little ploy we can do this little 900 ton corvette sitting in northern europe that could be sent to southeast asia and that would give us just enough to be able to send the safax back home so i'm going to do that uh, i'm going to move i'm going to just switch to the full screen and i'm going to press m uh, there is a different move dialog box, which you can bring up by right clicking, but it's incredibly complicated and I never use it. So here I'm going to go and say Southeast Asia. And let's go back to Zoom. And if I just expand this out, you'll see that it now says we're in Northern Europe. We're going to move to the Mediterranean with the ultimate destination of Southeast Asia. Obviously, it will have to go to the Indian Ocean next and then Southeast Asia. Uh, that's going to take it four months and there may well be some delays on the way because <laughs> this is 1890 and communications get delayed and, and stuff and once it's arrived we'll then be able to send the safax back home and that will allow us to improve our cruiser position in home waters by one which is good as well as the ships in service you will also get ships under construction. And here we have two. They are different classes from our existing classes of cruisers, but not remarkably so. So the Guidons, for example, 7,600, 21 knots, 8 inch, 5 inch, 2 inch, no torpedoes, 4 inch um, protection system. The Admiral Sharma, in comparison, 8 inch, 6 inch instead of 5, 3 inch instead of 2, and submerged torpedoes, and a 4 inch protection system at 21 knots. I like this a lot. This is substantially better gunned and has torpedoes. Now, the, the torpedoes aren't uh, great in this era. They're only like a thousand yards range. You primarily use them to finish off damaged ships, but it does mean that other enemy ships have to stay honest and not come too close to you unless you are crippled for the same level of protection. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm liking that and also slightly smaller, which will be a little bit cheaper. So yeah, that's a, that's a good design. And if we compare the Safaxes, six inches, two inches, couple of torpedoes, two inch belt, 22 knots. And the Amaral Cecile, six inch, two inch submerged uh, torpedoes, Two inch and 20 inch, basically identical so far as I can see. Um, because we have a surplus here of 2000, it means that we can build a couple more cruisers. And if we look here, where we only currently have one cruiser in operation in Europe. And in a few months' time, we will get a second. If we build two more, that will give us four cruisers. And that seems to be a much better uh, position to be in than, uh, than only having one. So I'm going to go to Build Ship, which brings up this. And I'm going to sort it by displacement. For some reason, it always sorts initially by the smallest ship rather than the biggest ship. And here you can see our ships, the battleships, the Marengo, the Gideon, the new Admiral Shana that I like, the Admiral Cecile, which is essentially a copy of the Suffax. Um, and then here is a completely new ship that has been designed but hasn't been built. So let's have a look, look at the um, Quit Logon. So 4,100 tons, 22 knots, good speed, two inch protection. Only two five inch guns, 10 three inch, eight two inch, four tall, uh, submerged. It's yeah, I don't like that. It's it's obviously designed as effectively a, a, a light scout cruiser and would be presumably a lot cheaper. So, if we have a look at the monthly build, that's 862, whereas for an Amaral Cecile. 
it's 1200 so it's two-thirds the cost so you know that's that's not nothing but for two-thirds the cost it's also a lot lot weaker too weak i think however i'm liking the admiral sharma it also costs 1200 it's only i mean less than a tiny amount less than 50 more expensive than the admiral seal uh i'm gonna want two of those and i'm gonna say okay and there they are added uh to the list and we are at minus 107 which is trivial we've got fifteen and a half thousand to play with and our budget tends to rise your economy tends to increase as tensions increase uh, with your opponents also the budget increases so i'm absolutely fine with that that is not a problem if we go back to the ships in service we'll notice that there's this div column here so actually just for completeness let's go through the columns formally and introduce them to you so uh, first of all you have the type this uses the american navy type system that many of us will be familiar with um developed just around the turn of the 19th century and then revised 1920 for the washington naval treaties so b for pre-dreadnoughts ca for um, armored cruiser later heavy cruiser cl for protected cruiser later light cruiser ke for corvettes the corvettes come in different sorts so we have one here which is 17,000 17,000 1700 tons uh, notice this little c by the speed that denotes it as being fitted out for colonial service that makes it actually fulfill a larger amount of tonnage requirement because it's well adapted for out being out in the colonies the second one is only 900 tons this is classically used either for anti-submarine warfare but we have no submarines at the moment uh, to be anti against and mine sweeping uh, and again mine warfare is a bit primitive just at the moment then you have the name the class the displacement the speed and the speed has various codes against it so we've already seen the c for colonial here is s's that means it's got short range if it has nothing it's medium range if it has an l it's long range and an e it's extreme range and then another one you may see is a small a if it is a small a then it has cramped accommodation and if it is uh, far away from base the crew quality is likely to decline after a month or two of service and you'll need to send it back here is the number of radars don't have to worry about that here is the asw value uh, when submarines come along these will have an asw of three but currently it's nothing because there aren't any the year that they were built their current location their status this is currently all set to AF, which is active fleet, but there is a number of statuses it could be. So you could have the reserve fleet. Reserve fleet will have a crew quality of only fair. The active fleet will tend to have a crew quality of good once it's been in the active fleet for a little while. It could be mothballed, which will have a crew quality of poor. Um, in reserve you save on maintenance money in mothballs you save on maintenance money even more when there's a war you could be on trade protection you could set your ships to foreign station this is a automatic foreign station setting and would turn the status to fs um, if you can't be bothered sorting out your ships and sending them here and there as i'm doing you can just put it to foreign station and it'll all sort it for you it'll be a bit ugly but you know you don't have to worry about it so yes so one thing we could do is for example put a couple of these battleships into reserve and now we can see that their maintenance cost has gone from 170 to 85 ships that are out on foreign station tend to cost more so the Taj here is 132 because that's in europe whereas its sister ships are 158 
because they are out in the colonies. This is crew quality. Currently it's all at fair. If these ships stay in the active fleet, that will improve to good in a few months time, three, four months time. A quick summary of the main weapons, the primary and secondary weapons of these ships. It's blockade strength. These ships contribute nine to any blockade, these six, these four. The bigger the number, the more likely you are to achieve a blockade against an enemy. And if your enemy is blockaded, their uh, level of unrest is likely to increase. Uh, our unrest level down here is currently level two, which is a small concern. It really should be zero. So I'll be looking for that to go down. If it gets to level 10, then you're in the risk of resolution. And certainly in a war, the higher the unrest goes, the more pressure there is to sue for peace. Then here is the division it's assigned to. There are no divisions set up, so I'm going to set them up in a moment. And then here are the officers that command. They all have question marks against them because they're all brand new and we don't know anything about them. Over here is the officers. Let me take that off. And you can see they're all listed out by rank and by name you can there's a preferences to say make these ranks uh, english equivalent years of service how many battles they've been in their ability their which is above average below average etc or average special ability their status whether on active service or not uh, i don't think we need to see any dead officers and we don't need to see any retired ones they will retire of their own accord and what they're currently doing what they're commanding. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to bring up the division editor. And we're going to create some divisions. The divisions are units that the ships will operate in. So we're going to make a BX one, that's B and BB, uh, pre dreadnought and uh, dreadnought. So there's a battle division. And I might just leave it at that at the moment because Almost all the other ships are off in other places. I'm going to add some ships to this. I'm going to add all four battleships and then close that. Some of these columns you can sort on and some of them you can't. But you can sort on speed. Uh, you can sort on displacement. You can sort on type, for example. You can sort on location. So I think that's enough for now. We've got some new construction and we are moving a Corvette so that we are adjusting our fleet in home waters from having only one cruiser and four battleships to eventually having four cruisers and four battleships, which seem like a nice number. When, when that's organized, I will put together some cruiser divisions for them to be in and give them some roles, but not at the moment because they're not around. So let's press the big turn button. And yes, I am aware that I've not done a few things. I've not touched research or doctrine or designing a ship. All in good, all in, all in, all in good time. Right. So the Captain Rossat of the Rishu has been promoted to Rear Admiral and he now commands the 1st Battle Division. Hooray! The British have laid down uh, an armoured cruiser. Fair enough. So some of these turns can be pretty quick. Ah, okay. So there's been an up internal upheaval in Albania. Italy is apparently sending a force ostensibly to re restore order to capture it. Um, what should we do? Well, we should issue an ultimatum or we should uh, push for an international force or we should not risk tensions. Now, we are disadvantaged here because our fleet is in Northern Europe, not in the Mediterranean. So we could issue an ultimatum. That will increase tensions a lot, which is fair enough. You see the uh, two pluses. We could push for an international force, and that will push up tensions by one. 
and we could um, not do anything. Let's, if I had a fleet in the Mediterranean, I would push more strongly, but let's send an international force and see if that works. Uh, Italy reluctantly recalls the expedition to Albania as the international force arrives. Hooray for a bit of international diplomacy. So we have saved Albania from Italian control for now. Okay, that's great. Various bits of news. Some of our captains have below ability and some have above ability. Uh, some new constructions and all of that is good stuff. Japan tensions increasing. Then you reduce as they do not raise tension with a strong nation. Oh, okay. You'll notice my little Corvette here has now reached the Indian Ocean. So next month in April, it hopefully will arrive in Southeast Asia and I can send back the Safax to Northern Europe. Ships under construction, you can see in months. We've got the Amaral Cecile in six months, the Amaral Shana in seven, and its two sisters in 20 months. So a fair old bit of time, but that's okay. The ship that I would love to be able to replace is these battleships because I don't really rate them very much. If we have a little look, they have two 12 inch, two 10 inch and four five inch guns. Ignore the uh, the graphic that seems to imply that it has eight five inch guns. Uh, the number is the source of truth, not the graphic. Uh, these little bugs will no doubt be fixed soon. Uh, I'm not thrilled with that. If we look in the almanac and we go and say, have a look at Britain, uh, you can click on any of these countries. You can see the national data, some facts and figures, and stuff about their research success. We can see their ships. Now, we have no intelligence against the British at the moment, so you have to treat this with a pinch of salt. But they seem to be operating three classes of battleships. The Collingwoods, who have a massive 16-inch belt, apparently. Treat that with a bit of caution because on 12 and a half thousand tons, they also have four 13 inch guns, six five inch and eight two inch and five torpedoes. I mean, it's got a lot. Speed of zero, no, uh, a speed of 16. I can believe that. You have the Howes, which are similarly equipped, but only three 13 inch guns, one in the rear, two in the forward, 14 inch belt, four torpedoes. Seems a lot. And then they have the Royal Sovereigns, that they're building that we have no intelligence on. And likewise, we could look at other people once uh, they become of interest. For example, the Italians, that's, that's the Italians look like they're interesting. So they have Vittorio Emmanuel building, so we won't find anything about them. And the Romas, so the Romas, four 13 inch guns, eight six inch, 16 2 inch guns and 5 torpedoes with a 16 inch belt. Blimey. On 11,000 tons? That's, that, seems, that seems too much in multiple directions. So let's, um, let's increase our intelligence with Italy up to medium. You'll notice there's an asterisk against it. That's because we've requested intelligence efforts to be put against Italy, but it's not yet in place. Whilst we're there, we will also go to research and increase research up to 10%. The default is eight, which is, I don't know, I don't think anybody plays with 8% research. You can increase it to 12% of your naval budget, but there's a strong amount of diminishing returns at 11 and 12%. So unless I'm strongly behind, I tend to keep it at 10. Here are all your search areas, your engines, your armor, your hull, your fire control, your guns, your ship design, armor piercing and explosive shells and your naval guns. This list will grow actually quite rapidly over the years. Uh, where you are with this? Well, we are nowhere. We only, we only have uh, our basic results at the moment because we've just started the game. Hence level zero, we've had zero new technologies developed. And the priority by default is set to minimum. Sorry, it's set to medium. I set them all to low and then like to pick the areas that I think are particularly interesting. So I think the engines, the ship design and the armor are particularly interesting. Fire control later on will become interesting, but it's going to take a while. And this is an era where you really want your guns 
to uh, get some get some love and see some serious improvement. So that's that's what I'm going to do there. The the priority just shifts things along a little bit, but it's not deterministic. Just because you've set something to high priority doesn't mean necessarily it's going to come out sooner. It probably will come out sooner rather than it would have done otherwise. Uh, that sent our monthly balance back to 140 in the red, whereas the growth in tensions had increased our budget just enough to take it into the black, but it's all fine. So let's go to April. Uh, you'll notice our little Corvette is delayed. It should have arrived, but it hasn't because of communication lag. So that's a little bit annoying. And then we will go to May. But first of all, our spies, even though we're not particularly spying on the Japanese, has had a look at one of their cruisers. So six eight inch guns, broadside of uh, five, 12 five inch guns, 10 two inch guns, four inch deck, no torpedoes, which I think is a mistake, 21 knots. Reasonably classic, straightforward cruiser. Uh, and 8,500 tons, actually a little bit heavy for what you're getting. You know, we're getting something in the 7,000s kind of uh, range. So that's that. And then into June. Ah, now, private shipbuilding has expanded the size of our docks by 1,000 tons. Well, thank you very much. Setbacks in armor, which is a bit of a sad thing. So... Dock size over here, 15,000. It was 14,000. We can build the docks ourselves. Uh, it would cost 600 per month for 12 months. And I will do later, but just for now, we're not really near the fulfilling the size of the docks we already have. So that's a little thing for later on, but you have to keep your dock size competitive. Our Corvette has reached Southeast Asia. It's a shame you have to kind of keep that in mind. It's easy to miss. So the suffix is, uh, whoops, I'm going to press M. There we go. I'm going to send it to Northern Europe. And in a few months time, that will arrive, which will be excellent. And in three, four months time, we will get these two cruisers being built. So that will be brilliant because that will really put us into a much firmer footing. We're not building up our funds just enough at the moment. So once these two cruisers are finished, I am going to have a look at our battleship design and see if we can come up with something better. But I think that's going to be for the next episode. I think that's enough for now. We've done pretty much everything you do in a peacetime navy particularly at the very start we've looked at our fleet we've examined how it's deployed we've sought to address some of the weaknesses in our deployment particularly here in our uh, northern europe uh, by shifting around ships and by building some new ones we've had a look at the quality of our ships against our likely opponents uh, we've adjusted our intelligence efforts to meet the fact that we may well have to go to war with Italy if things uh, carry on as they are. And we are in a solid place to carry on into the second half of 1890 and see our fleet mature because probably in 91 or almost certainly in 92, we will be at war with either Italy or Germany, would be my guess. There is some volatility in these events, and they can. Peace can break out suddenly, or tensions can suddenly bubble up, or sometimes tensions can be absolutely fizzing at the max level, but not actually flipping into war. Part of the fun of the game is not knowing how that's going. But for now, it feels like a solid start. And I hope that it encourages you, when this is released in a couple of weeks' time, to get in here, get a little navy, push it around, and start enjoying the complex series of challenges and decision-making that is the characteristic of Rule of the Waves 3. Thanks for watching.